Good morning, everybody. Welcome back. This is Plugged Into History, brought to you by Middleton Place Foundation. And today is On the Farm Wednesday. So we are here in the beating heart of the plantation, or in the stable yards. And um, today we are talking with Nicole and Jeff. Um, Nicole Thompson is our volunteer coordinator for Beyond the Fields and for the Stable Yards and she is also the resident seamstress here on the property and our expert in all things textile. Um, and Jeff is our director of interpretation and preservation. Uh, so thank you very much for watching. Today we are going to focus on the clothing of the enslaved workers here at Middleton Place and in general um, on plantation properties like Middleton Place. And we're also going to talk a little bit about the work of clothing. Um, so thanks very much for being here and we'll start with Nicole today. Well good morning everyone. Thanks for joining us again. Um, Hopefully everyone enjoyed yesterday's presentation um, and hopefully you're going to learn a little bit more today. Um, so first of all, uh, yesterday we talked about the fact that clothing did a lot of things. It um, illustrated your position in society, it illustrated the wealth that you had, um, and clothing for the enslaved isn't any different to be quite honest with you. Um, not all slaves are dressed exactly alike. There are varying types of fabric that are used for slave clothing um, and they are given clothes or are dressing uh, for the appropriate uh, job that they're performing. Um, and I want to point out that here in South Carolina in the 18th century, um, those fabrics and clothes are actually dictated by the law. Um, the Negro Act of 1740 has an Article 40, um, I know that's lots of 40s, that actually dictates the type of fabrics um, that owners are allowed, that can allow their slaves to wear. Um, and if they should be caught wearing clothes finer, that's the terminology they use above that, um, anyone can order them to remove their clothing. Um, can confiscate it for themselves. Um, the owner can actually be brought up on charges. Um, so there actually is a law um, that's dictating that. And of the types of fabrics that they're dictating, Negro cloth is very common, blue linen, check linen, scotch plaids, uh, chintzes, calicoes. If you were to read the description of all those fabrics, every single one of them either says cheap, inexpensive, Horse. Um, a lot of times it says heavy or light. Uh, so these are fabrics, uh, you know, not fine fabrics that they are specifically using for um, slave clothing. It does mention in the law there is one exception, and the exception is livery of men and boys. Um, and so we're going to talk about our livery here at Middleton. So livery was worn by footmen, doormen, coachmen. Um, any others that I'm thinking of? That's pretty much, keep in mind, we're, we're talking inside the house, okay, when we're talking livery. And this is a special costume, not worn every day, usually for a special occasion, okay? The one thing I, I'm always impressed about the livery, and, and first of all, our livery here is actually based upon records or the receipts we have of the livery that was worn here at Middleton Place, okay? We know of the two different color variations, which is very common in livery. You'll especially see it on the cuffs and the collars, if you do it with that, okay? You'll also see we have, just like yesterday, we have the waistcoat, all right? Matter of fact, if you think about it, how Arthur Middleton would have been addressed when we showed his costume is very similar. Generally speaking, the fabric for livery was broadcloth, all right, which was... And that's a wool. wool. It, it is a wool. Very expensive, very, very finely a made fine wool. with that. You know, we also mentioned yesterday, we talked about how the clothes show someone's status, all right? In the case of the livery, we're not showing the status of the enslaved person. We're showing the, the status of the person who owns this person. All right. So again, this is maybe one of the best examples, I always think when you think of livery, uh, when we talk of enslaved people being property first, this is a prime example of it all right, that we're showing with that. And uh, 
If you all were able to catch our earlier presentation some weeks ago with Rakina in the House Museum, we do have two brass buttons with the Middleton crest on them that uh, were part of a suit yeah, of livery part like of the this. Livery. Uh -huh. So go back and check that out um, for more information on that. And we do show a shot of those livery buttons. So, um, And don't forget, folks, since I broke in on these two here, sorry about that, uh, make sure that you drop your questions in the comment section there. We're happy to ask them live, real time with Jeff and Nicole. Or um, if you are dropping those comments and questions in after the broadcast, don't worry. We'll get back to those as well. I think it's important to note about livery too that each family would have their own sets mm -hmm. of colors and designs. Uh, so if you were to see a coachman wearing this in downtown Charleston, you would absolutely know that that coachman was part of the Middleton um, family, that uh, he was driving for them. Um, if you've ever had the opportunity to visit Williamsburg, uh, they have great examples of the governor's livery uh, there as well. And you know, the, the other thing, remember too, with those buttons we talked about, being gold buttons and having that Middleton crest on them, well that's the stamp of the owner right there. Mm -hmm. Alright, so it's, it's on display on this person to show everyone who this person belongs to. You know, now we go from the finer, um, should we work our way down? Sure. Let, let's let's do our female. I'll tell you what, I'm going to move her out just a little bit. Nicole, I'll let you... So you may have noticed that this looks familiar. This was the gown that I was wearing yesterday. And I mentioned briefly yesterday as we were dressing Karen and Jeff that the house slaves oftentimes were dressed differently than slaves working in the field or slaves working in the kitchen. Um, and that's because the owner and again, it's all up to the owner, may have decided that they wanted the slaves um, that were present to other people um, wearing a finer type of clothes. Now, um, this again would just be a basic blue checked linen, and that is allowed according to the law. Um, it is in a gown fashion. Um, white linens, blue linens, they're all allowed within the law. Um, we are able to also figure out what people are wearing based on runaway ads. Um, a lot of what we know about clothing of enslaved people in the 18th century come from runaway ads. Uh, not only do they um, address the physical description of the runaway, but the easiest way to change your appearance in the 18th century is to change your clothes. You had a question. Um, actually, we had a comment which I thought was wonderful and that I'd really like to draw attention to, which was, I like how her sleeves are pieced, and I think she's talking about you, Nicole. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so I knew that, I knew you planned to get to that later, but yeah. yes, Nicole is wearing a, a gown that or a jacket that she wears frequently here for work. So it has a life um, that would at least minimally reflect. Mm -hmm. Uh, the life of um, a garment out. in the 18th century. It gets worn out, it needs repair. So we'll let her talk about that in a little bit, but thank you for noticing. So one of the things that I wanted to, um, when we talked about runaway ads and how descriptive they are, I have recently found a runaway ad from here in South Carolina in the Charleston area uh, for a young female uh, in 1756. And the ad says that she took with her when she ran away a yellow quilted petticoat. Now, ironically enough, we are working on a yellow quilted petticoat here in the textile shop right now. Uh, quilted petticoats uh, were worn by all different classes of people, Europeans as well as enslaved as well. Um, so I just wanted to show everyone mm -hmm. that, that that's something that we are um, in the process of recreating. Um, speaking of runaway ads, I think that it's important to move on to our other set of clothing. Um, we are very um, lucky here at Middleton uh, to have access to a great amount of documentation. Uh, and one of those documents is a runaway ad uh, that was uh, uh, placed in the South Carolina Gazette by Henry Middleton. Um, and its description, and I'll let Jeff talk about that. I was going to say, should we, should we read this off? Uh, sure. This appeared in the South Carolina Gazette, 7 November 1761. 
run away from one of the subscribers' plantations at Horse Savannah on Monday night, the 19th of October last, three Gambian Negro fellows who were lately bought out of Captain Watts' cargo and speak no English. One of them is short, well, black, well-set fellow, and stoops very much, occasioned by a large wound he had in his back, either between or a little below his shoulders, the scar of which is still very visible. Another is a middle-sized fellow of a yellowish complexion and is much marked in the face with his country marks. The last fellow answers to the name of Scipio. The short fellow is named Will and the other Jacob. They had on white negro cloth jackets and breeches and caps of the same and carried with them their blankets and axe. Whoever apprehends the said Negroes and will bring them to my plantation on Ashley River or deliver them to the warden of the workhouse shall receive a reward of three pounds currency for each besides all lawful charges. Signed, Henry Middleton. Now, as you can tell just from that description, there is a lot of description in there of these three fellows. Okay? Uh, but what we'll focus on is mostly the clothing. As Nicole mentioned earlier, they say white Negro jackets and breeches. All right. Again, Negro cloth was kind of a generalized term, would you say? Because again, it could it could apply to a lot of inferior fabrics. Generally, the colors we're looking at are white, blue, and green. However, white sometimes doesn't exactly mean what we're thinking of white. White is, would you say, is more unbleached? Yes. So white, by definition, means lacking color. Um, so in the 18th century, this is often referred to as bleach. Uh, when we read white, if you read it as no color, this is the natural color of flax. It means that it hasn't been dyed yet. Okay, so we have um, a few questions here that have built up, and they are okay. not all specifically about this particular That's John Bond's mannequin. Okay. We'll do what we can. Um, so, were most of these fabrics produced on the plantation or purchased in town, imported? No, they are not purchased here at the plantation or any local plantation. In fact, uh, Charleston imports more fabric for the making of clothes of slaves than any other type of fabric. So they're not um, producing it here, they're, they're not they're producing buying the fabric, they're buying the fabric, yes. And, and this is the other thing, keep in mind, time periods, plantations, they're all different. All right, so if we went to a place, let's say more maybe in Alabama, Mississippi, Virginia, they may well as be made producing they uh, could, cloth. Yes. Some of it also has to do when you're talking the size of your enslaved force. For example, Henry Augustus Middleton Jr., who uh, owns the Weehaw Plantation down on the Cumbie River in the 1850s, 1855, he has 259 enslaved people there. He is buying the fabric. They are not producing anything there. Now what's interesting is for the winter allotment, if I remember correctly, it's 1,800 yards mm -hmm. of, of WW Plains. Plains is kind of a 19th century term for Negro cloth. Right. It's a cotton and wool blend, yeah. yes. And then uh, for the summer clothing, he's buying 1,400 yards. But in addition to that, he's buying 600 packages of needles. He's buying all this thread. So he's actually, even though they're buying the cloth, they are being made by themselves. He may have a team of seamstresses doing this. This may be individuals doing this. Uh, we don't really know according to his journal. He exactly. actually specifies that the clothing is being made and distributed. That's yeah, actually the very go. first okay. line That's of his it. journal. Um, it also, you have to keep in mind, if we're talking here at Middleton Place, uh, this, the Middletons are very into growing, they're growing rice to produce their wealth, they're growing indigo. Um, it takes a lot of natural fibers to produce fabric. Um, and so from a cost perspective, in the Middleton's case, and not all cases, we don't want to generalize, um, it is more cost effective that for them to buy fabric. In fact, we have receipts from Henry um, and Arthur, I believe, where they're purchasing Negro cloth. Mm -hmm. um, because Correct. I think Henry makes note that he's very disappointed in the quality based on how much he's actually paid for this cloth. So the fabric is not being produced here, but clothes are. Absolutely. Yes. Got it. Uh -huh. Absolutely. We, from our uh, slave records, we know for a fact that there are enslaved seamstresses and tailors here at Middleton. But I'll, I'll add one thing onto that. Keep in mind, too, some clothing, like, again, it's going back to the 
the We Call Journal, they are purchasing coats. Oh, yes. yes. So I guess sometimes it may depend on what type of piece what of clothing government? that we're looking at as well. Mm -hmm. Again, I, it goes around that efficiency, how much cost, how much time, those all play a factor into this. And we also know from documentation that on smaller plantations, it's actually the woman of the household and her daughters re that are creating shirts and garments for their enslaved. Mm -hmm. So if they have a smaller enslaved population um, and less means, uh, that the actual family could be um, selling these garments. You know, it's interesting you bring that up. One other thing on that is that depending upon the size of the enslaved population you have, on larger plantations, what you usually find is a winter allotment and a summer allotment. On a smaller place that maybe only have just a few enslaved people, what you're looking at is clothing is usually distributed as needed. As needed. Mm -hmm. All right. So that again, that changes. It, it it varies so much how this operates. And clothing allotments are based on the duties that you're performing. Uh, so we've you know through the journals of Henry Augustus Middleton Jr. We know that his driver on that particular plantation is receiving more um, clothing than some of his other. Um, we know that his trunk minders are receiving great coats, which are outer garments, more often than some of his other yeah. male slaves. So uh, some of it depends on what duties yeah. and what jobs you're performing. Keep on this plant that plantation was a rice plantation. And the people who are getting more clothing and better quality are the driver, the trunk minder who's watching that field, and then the engineer. The engineer yeah, is the yeah. enslaved person that's running the mill to process all this rice. So it sounds like there's not really a, a blanket answer on all of this. Yeah. So we really have to <laughs> look individualized plan. In history, we so. never say never and we never say always. <laughs> yeah. uh, because there are always exceptions to the rules. Yeah, and we sure. can look at all these documents, and we can look at drawings and paintings, and, and come up with some sort of, OK, this is kind of how things are going. Uh, but there are always exceptions to yeah, the sure. rules. So we have a question about the quilted petticoat, and I sure. see it's from Heidi. And Heidi, I'm glad that you're watching today because you had a question yesterday that I could not answer without talking to Nicole. So here's Nicole, and so I'm going to ask your first question from yesterday first, and then I'll ask you a question about the quilted petticoat. Yesterday, Heidi wanted to know what the fabric on the back of my stomacher was. Oh, and it, since I didn't have it in hand last night, I couldn't it's answer it. It's just a heavy <laughs> linen twill. Heavy um, linens well. Yeah. Okay, so Heidi, if you're still there, that's what it yeah. is. Most <laughs> often, stomachers aren't reversible. I mean, we think about things in that context today. Um, but basically, um, the, uh, the presentable fabric is on the outside. There's some sort of stiffener in the inside. In modern times, we call it interfacing. They would call it buckram. Um, and then just some sort of plain old Jane linen on the back. All right, so I'll make sure to put that in the comments section from yesterday's video as well. But I saw her name and I wanted to get that out there. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so Heidi would like to know about the quilted petticoat. How did you and how did they make the stitching lines? Um, so we used chalk um, and they absolutely um, well. Um, but more often than not, um, they are doing it simply by sight. Uh, now, there are actual professional, professional, excuse me, quilters in the 18th century. So if you were well off, um, like the Middletons, they could have purchased quilted petticoats. Um, but for lower class enslaved and indentured servants, they would have been making their own. Um, and the crosshatch pattern that you see on the one that we have is pretty standard. We see that quite often. Quilted petticoats can be made um, with silk as an outer layer. It can be made with linen as an outer layer. It can even be made with wool as an outer layer. Um, but almost, almost always, they are stuffed or bat using batting of wool on the inside. So um, they really are for warmth. That's what they're being used for. Um, again, wealthy people might have some very ornate stitching on it, so it is a decorative piece, but they are being used for warmth. And then a question from Cindy, and I think this is in reference to the clothing worn by enslaved folks. Um, is there a greater French influence or English influence on both the men's and women's style? 
So I don't have a definitive answer for that. I would really say that it probably has to do a lot with the owner and what their heritage is. Um, we know that if you go throughout the colonies in the 18th century, whether it's the Scotch, the Dutch, the English, uh, even sometimes their religious uh, aspects, that dictates the types of clothing that they're wearing or the styles. Um, and so a lot of the um, enslaved Africans that come here don't possess the same sort of English skills um, that we would see in other um, like indentured servants, seamstresses. And so the owner would tell the slave, I want it cut this way, I want it sewn this way. Um, my guess, and it is my guess, is that they are going for something that's very simplistic, very easy to put together. Um, so petticoats are simply two panels sewn together on two sides and put a waistband on it. Uh, a short gown like I'm wearing right now has a little bit of shape to it, but a bed gown is nothing more than an oversized jacket of a tee. Um, so I, I would guess that that has a lot to do with it. Um, and we've got another one. How difficult is it to put on and take off these kinds of clothes? Did enslaved people need help dressing also? Um, not necessarily. Um, even myself, I have learned I can put my own stays on, I can dress myself in the morning. I will tell you that nine years ago it probably took me 40 minutes to get dressed. I got dressed this morning in 12 minutes. Um, you get used to it. But keep in mind that slaves live in communities, so there would have been other people around to help them mm -hmm. if they needed it. Yeah. Remember, as, as we talked yesterday of with, let's say, the Middletons having either, either a manservant or a woman servant, it's not necessarily necessary to have one to have you do that. It's more or less a choice do you want someone to do this. So as far as putting something on, can it be done by yourself? Yes, it can be done. In some garments. In some not garments. Not Karen's. Yeah. <laughs> I would have, it would have taken me an hour and a half to yeah. figure that out by myself. But anyway. <laughs> You know, going back um, with, with the free manicure, this is, I think, one of the difficult parts when you're looking at, if you're trying to get a generalization of enslaved clothing, because there's so many factors. Uh, of course, we're talking out here um, rural, all right? If we were to go inside the city, if you go urban, you're going to see different styles of clothing down there, okay, that what's, a, what's available to an enslaved person. Also, and I think Nicole hit on this very much, a lot of it depends upon the job that you're doing. All right, they are going to require different sets of clothes and things with that. One of the big questions we get, and of course we don't have any here on it, is about shoes. All right, we know that shoes were very much given as part of that allotment. Uh, matter of fact, again, going back to that 1855 down at the Weehaw, 202 pairs of brogans are given out. Now, here's the thing. What we find, though, when looking through records and journals and, and um, other accounts, is that many enslaved people just are not wearing shoes. All right? question is why? If they're given shoes, why aren't they wearing shoes? All right? I think one thing has to be, sometimes I think it's the work that you're doing, because these shoes are not going to last. Uh, matter of fact, we know that, again, at the, at, on the Weehaw Plantation, in the spring months, the plowmen, the trunk minders, and uh, the cattle drivers were all given extra pairs of shoes at that time, because that's when they're bringing everything in. All right. The work's being done. Also, many of these shoes, I would dare say, probably don't fit well. They are probably not comfortable to wear, so why wear them, all right, if it's going to cause you any discomfort? And then the other thing is, we also know that, um, for example, going to church for Sunday gatherings, many times shoes would be safe because that's when you would dress up a little bit. So why destroy your shoes during the week when you can kind of keep them uh, for special occasions? So you can look a little nicer. So I think there's periods when you would wear them and you're not going to wear them. All right. And keep in mind that allotments are not, most allotments that we are familiar with are not given on the, oh well, an as needed basis like Jeff said, oh well you need a new pair of shoes, we'll give them. So in some cases, you know, if you saved something from mm -hmm. a previous yeah. allotment, now you're being given something else. And mm -hmm. so it kind of helps to add to the wardrobe um, and you can swap things out. Yeah. You know, the other thing with clothing I hear a, a lot from visitors is everyone talks about hand-me-downs, 
Okay. Now, hand-me-downs, yes. We do, we do have many accounts of enslaved people receiving hand-me-downs from owners or others. However, I want you to keep in mind the people that are probably getting those hand-me-downs are probably the people that are in closest relationship to the owner. So we may just be looking at enslaved people inside the house that have any opportunity. Not saying it's definitely going to happen. There's an opportunity. Whereas if we look at a field hand, there's probably no opportunity at all there for it. It's probably not going to happen. And since you're mentioning that, Jeff, let's remind folks that um, being an enslaved person, regardless of your job task, is you know still part of an institution that's outside oh, of yes. someone's control. Keep in mind. So it's not necessarily better. Yeah. The no. status. Or another. Now the status is always the same. They are always enslaved. All right. The circumstance in which they live in, that's what varies. All right, that's what's going to change. The circumstances are always a little different, just as it is today with any individual. But that status always stays the same. Keep in mind, this is not some. This is something that's. I love the word allotment. All right, this is something that's being given to. Not something that they're choosing or having a right. say, or they're going out and purchasing. Say, oh, I want this and this. No, this is something allotment that is given to you. All right, that's provided to to you. Very much like. Um, if you look at the military, I guess might be the, the, the prime example. You're given a certain clothing because we want you to wear this. Not what you want to wear, what we're dictating you to wear. Right. And keep in mind, I said earlier, that it's very difficult for us to know exactly what slaves were um, wearing because there's you know, very little documentation. We rely on runaway ads, and we are very lucky here at Middleton that uh, some of the family members through the years kept journals about what they were doing, but their property. You have a better chance of knowing how the Middletons took care of their racehorses than you did how they took mm -hmm. care of their slaves. That's how little they value them. They do not consider, they don't look at them as humans. Um, so it, it's difficult to find documentation to support a lot of this stuff sometimes because they're just not writing yeah. it down. And the, the other thing with that I'd say too, just because it's written down, doesn't mean that's necessarily, necessarily what's happening either. And what, so what I'm hearing in terms of uh, keeping pieces from previous allotments or working within the confines of what one is given, this is how we can see an exercise of agency through yeah. garments. Sure. Um, yeah. So everybody, one of the reasons that we come through and we need to and want to and must talk about all of these aspects of enslaved life and including clothing is because clothing is such an expression of self and so even within confines of that which is given to you um, there are some choices to be made and, and some agency to be expressed even though it's so limited and keep in mind why do we wear clothes well, there's a lot of different okay <laughs> well i would say one one is okay one is Protection from the protection elements. From That's the probably elements. one big one right there. Two is that personal expression. Okay. Some of it is, shall we say, vanity as well. I think you throw it. So there's many reasons, and these affect all people of all cultures and, and of all races that have these feelings. As when I read certain runaway ads, uh, a lot of times, particularly when they talk about Negro wenches running away, because that's how they usually refer to them, they will make note of the color or the pattern of the head cloth that they have, mm -hmm. that they were wearing when they ran away, um, because that's a huge element of that culture. Um, and I don't think I've ever come across an ad that says just plain old white. They're typically some sort of colored or checkered, um, so they're choosing these more colorful garments mm -hmm. as, as an adornment. So we do have some more questions here, yeah. and I just wanted to thank everybody. I've seen more people pop up as watching, so thanks. We're here with uh, Nicole, who is our resident seamstress and textile expert here at Middleton Place. Um, volunteer coordinator for the Beyond the Fields and for the Stable Yards, and Jeff, Director of Interpretation and <laughs> Preservation. Um, so these guys are definitely the experts here um, on the, well, the Stable Yard, the beating heart of the plantation. So were people expected to wear as much clothing even during the hot summer months? Um, I don't really think, there's not always an expectation. I think you might have heard Jeff mention it yesterday that there are accounts uh, that uh, travelers make and owners make that when they go into the fields in the summertime, 
a lot of times their enslaved people working in the fields are all but naked other than a loincloth or mm -hmm. a shift. Um, again, it depends on what your particular role is. Now, if you the guy are in the livery, an not so much. Yeah, if, you're, if yeah. you're an enslaved woman in the house that is serving the mistress, um, or you're going to be in the dining room, then yes, there probably is an expectation being set about exactly how much clothing you're wearing yeah. into the dining room. Um, and then what about adult clothing repurposed for children? Any, uh... That absolutely is uh, more than likely happening. However, in Henry Augustus mm -hmm. Middleton's journals, we know that he is specifically making allotments of clothing for children. He documents it. Um, so again, it's an owner preference, um, and we can't say, oh, well, this always happened or this never happened. And when you say a lot of the clothing, it, it's probably unisex? Yes. It, it's being born... To a certain born, extent. Yeah. Depending upon the age, I guess, and, and stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, um, I think we're caught up on questions for now. <laughs> so I think now we can go back to the presentation, such we as you we, we kind of hit the clothing. <laughs> you want to talk a little bit more about the, the fibers sure. and how this... So you know. we mentioned earlier when we talked about the Negro Act of 1740, how they were talking about specific types of fabric uh, that were to be used in um, slave clothing. Uh, and the biggest one, um, whether it's for slave clothing or clothing for the colonists and the owners, is wool. Uh, wool is everywhere in the colonies in the 80s. This is wool directly off of our sheep. Um, you can see it's nice and dirty. nasty. Yay. Yes. <laughs> um, the wool that is being brought into the colonies is coming That's... from mostly from Europe, um, and it is fashioned in many different types of fabric, everything from something that's coarse and loosely woven to something that is very refined and finished. Um, we also talk a lot about linen. Linen is my friend. I wear lots and lots of linen. And this is flax. And flax is a plant uh, that we use to create linen. Now, linen by definition can be flax or hemp. Um, but I find that most articles of clothing, they're using flax rather than hemp. Um, and these are stocks, there's literally hundreds of them in my hand right now, uh, that will be spun and woven into fabric. Uh, now in the later part of the 18th century, you'll sometimes see reference to uh, linsey or linsey woolsey. And what that means is they have taken the wool thread and the linen thread and they have woven it together to create a fabric. Um, and that's very common uh, in slave clothing. Um, in, the eight, in the 19th century, we see the combination of wool and cotton, because remember cotton becomes king here in the South, um, and that produces another type of fabric and this becomes very, very common. Um, in slave clothing until eventually slave clothing becomes almost all cotton. Uh, here in the Low Country, uh, they were all about rice and um, indigo, uh, but there was some cotton being grown on the outer islands, if you're familiar with John's Island, uh, James Island, uh, and they are growing Sea Island cotton, um, which is a very fine and refined type of cotton, and I can assure you that there were not slaves wearing Sea Island cotton. And that's about pretty much it as far as fibers go for enslaved clothing. But over on the table, um, Jeff has different examples of buttons and pins um, and different tools that can be used in the making of clothes. Again, going back to that, the We Hall Journal from Henry Augustus Middleton down on the Cumbie, uh, he talks of buying, uh, we have bone buttons that we know he's purchasing. We also know of wood buttons. Uh, we also know pewter buttons were actually used quite a bit. I was actually kind of surprised to find out how much pewter buttons were used in the enslaved clothing. Yeah. That, that kind of surprised me. I wasn't expecting that. that. Uh, we also know of needles and pins that are being bought and all this. 600 needles he buys. I can't imagine going through 600 needles in a year. Yeah. 
You know, there's one other thing that go back to the fabrics that I, I always, the fibers. The, the fibers here, excuse me, that I find fascinating is this right here, the wool. Okay, we know that one of the Middletons, matter of fact, Arthur Middleton's grandfather, okay, another Arthur, uh, we get them confused all the time <laughs> out here. All right, another Arthur, according to his will of 1739, I believe it is, he's raising sheep. Okay, so these sheep are not only being raised for food, but they're also being sheared for their wool. This right here, this wool for these enslaved Africans that are being brought over, this is something totally new to them. Okay, their probably only relation to wool may be through trade items, possibly of wool fabrics, but as far as processing and moving on this, this is something that's totally new to them. But they quickly mastered this whole skill of being able to shear it and wash it and card it and everything else that's, that's done to make that wool fabric. With these. What they're more familiar with, of course, is the cotton. This is something that's very much used in Africa. Of that. Now the other thing we talked about with the, with the fibers, we also have the whole dyeing process to bring in um, different colors here. Of course the big one here in South Carolina, indigo. Indigo is the big one out here. Um, not only is it very profitable, it's the fashion, that blue is kind of the fashion statement of the 18th century in a sense, but more importantly it's probably the easiest dye to use uh, uh, with this. It would be important to note, too, that indigo is very fashionable in Europe as a color, but here in the colonies, particularly in the southern colonies, it is um, associated with slave clothing. Slave so it's a little less popular among the gentry um, because it is associated with slave clothing. And many of these other uh, dyes that we, what they would use, using various materials, pokeberries, Spanish moss, all kinds of different things. Remember, they would have to use what's called a mordant, which is kind of a metallic substance that helps the dye to adhere to the cloth. Again, for enslaved Africans coming over, mordants aren't used much in, in African textiles at that time. Matter of fact, it's fairly new, but again, this is another skill that they quickly master. Uh, and the other thing is, is we talk about this Negro cloth being this, I'll say white in quotation marks here. What we find is that many enslaved people well, these clothing gets dyed, right? Some of this, of course, we, we did mention sometimes it does come in different colors, blue and green, mm -hmm. but many of this they're doing on their own, right? They're going out and they're collecting vegetable matter, roots, things, and creating these dyes. But I think it's also important, even though enslaved people are doing this and they are the one facilitating all of this, this is probably something that's being allowed wow. by the owner. Okay, it's, it's, or he, maybe he sees it's doing it and he's letting it go. So there's probably a reason behind why he's letting them do this. Uh, maybe giving them a sense of normalcy. Um, maybe he sees no harm in it or whatever. It's, it's hard to say. You know? Or helping him more of that. control. Um, and you know, that's the other thing I've read, looking at the clothing, if, if you go from field hands to, slave, or to uh, enslaved house servants, one thing you notice is field hands, do you are a little more uniform? Yes. In a sense, a lot more uniform, whereas within the house, you do see some more variety between individuals, all right? Which is kind of an interesting thing, and I, maybe it's because, as we mentioned, buying all this cloth, like Henry Augustus, and Amanda, 1800 yards, we're just going to, it's probably easier to just make everything the same. utilitarian type thing. And I yeah. think, unfortunately, um, when we think about that, a lot, that's how a lot of people think about clothing of the enslaved, is that it's utilitarian, that everybody is dressing the same way, and mm -hmm. that everyone's wearing the same thing. And again, just like yesterday we mentioned, keep in mind that it will also be regional. If you look away, at runaway ads from the Northeast, or a little bit like, let's say, Virginia, you will find a different variety of clothing than you will find mm -hmm. here in South Carolina or in, say, the Georgia Gazette. Where can we find such runaway ads, Nicole? You can. <laughs> uh, Google is your friend. Um, here in South Carolina, the History Archives, um, you can look them up. But there are a few different books that have been written. This one is by Don uh, Haggis, uh, Wives, Slaves, and Servant Girls. Um, and this is a collection of ads 
um, from all and up down the eastern seaboard, um, ranging from 1770 to 1783. Now that one's specifically about females, yes. so if you're looking for men's ads, you'll have to look elsewhere. But um, if you're a... here in South Carolina, the South Carolina Historical Society has a great collection mm -hmm. of runaway ads. Um, you can find them pretty much anywhere. Now keep in mind that there are thousands of runaway ads out there but there's probably only 30 or 40 percent that actually mention clothing. In a lot of cases, it's just simply the slave's name, who they ran away from or with, um, their age, yeah. and maybe some basic characteristics. Yeah, it's real interesting. Some, sometimes you get really great detail, yep. and then other times you don't get much detail at all. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I always wonder why. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, we <laughs> have one from Henry. Uh, Middleton that uh, he puts in, he's looking for a, uh, a male uh, who is a cobbler by trade, uh, was a drummer with the regiment, um, goes on for quite a bit to say about and never mentions what he's wearing, not one hmm. thing about his well, clothing. Well, that's Kulikon. Yeah. That is yeah. Kulikon, yeah. So. Well, so we have one more question. I think it's kind of a... Um, a great one to end on because we have to wrap it up here. Now, folks, if you have more questions, please put them in the comments section. I promise we come back to them. We do. We answer them, um, even if it's in the next day's video. Uh, so this one um, is going to be hard to be brief, but do y'all's best. I'm not sure who's um, being asked this, whether it's one of the two of you or myself, we all would have different answers to okay. this. So um, if I said I had a friend's son, who wanted your job when he grows up. What should I tell him? <laughs> passion. You have to have passion. For what? For what it is that you're interested in. So I personally, I have a passion for textiles and for fashion and it doesn't matter if it's in the 21st century or the 16th century or the 18th century. Um, you have to have passion. Okay. Mm -hmm. My first answer to that don't do it. Go find something you can actually earn a living at. <laughs> That's my first answer. However, my second answer to that, and really my main answer to that, is I think what you need is not only that passion, okay, but you need a dedication to it as well. Mm -hmm. You know, start, I would say, you know, you start now and you find something that you're really interested in and you dive right into it. Um, the one thing about being a historian that is, is one thing I think it's frustrating and it's also the, the part I love about it is that for every question I go and I go to a document and I'm looking for a question as soon as I find that answer I have five more questions that come from that answer all right and to me that's what the whole thing is I, I, I love the whole detective sense of it in falling sense. down the rabbit so hole. It's, it's having that passion <laughs> to continue but it's also having that dedication and also be willing to look at everything all right, answers and, and, and history is, is so inclusive. Um, not only inclusive, but, it, but it's also um, inclusive as well. All right, and I think realizing that and looking at it, you know, the whole study of history, I would say, is really we're looking at how do we relate to people or how have people related to each other through the years. And we can find that in so many different ways. So uh, I applaud you on that. Go for That's it. That's a great question. Fantastic. Yeah. Passion, perseverance. I would add that you. Uh, you have to be willing to learn a little bit about yourself. Um, go, go into yeah. it, you know, persevere through the, the difficult times, keep going at it, even if it suddenly seems like it's not your passion, it probably still is. And know that um, no matter what you do, at the end of the day, you'll never know everything. That's right, there's <laughs> no way more to learn. Very true. Anyway. Um, but it is through history that we are able to better understand ourselves, our own society, our current time, um, each other um, as we are now. And we really learn that uh, people in the past weren't all that different from us either. Um, I just have one more thing to say, Karen. Yeah. Um, I know that a lot of you are joining us from far off and we are so thrilled that you're doing that. But if you're local and you want to know more about this, come and see us. We have lots more to share and we have, we have artisans out here now that want to tell you what they do. The grounds are beautiful, the weather's amazing. Um, take that opportunity to get out and come and see us. Yeah, mm -hmm. I would say the vast majority of programs you've seen online here, this is something we do almost every day, almost every day out here uh, with this. And that's, that's what kind of makes it exciting. And plus, um, 
the, the one thing I always think with these online programs, I wish we could do the smell and the yeah, feel. Yeah, the smell of vision. You know, the smell of vision yeah. and stuff. Because it adds on a whole new dimension to it. And yeah. in case you haven't figured it out, we like to talk. <laughs> yeah. Happy to your questions. We do have to get going for this right. one. Um, but we thank you all so much. Folks, every time you tune in, every time you interact with us, every time you share, and every time you um, engage with us, you are helping Middleton Place to forward its mission of connecting people with the past and being able to better understand ourselves through American history. So we thank you so much for supporting Middleton Place Foundation, for supporting Plugged Into History, um, and for supporting all of our programming here, so. Hey, one last thing? Yeah. All right, today you've seen, these are all things that we've made. These are reproductions, all right? Tomorrow, we're gonna show you the real stuff. All right, we're gonna bring in our cur curator, Mary Ellen Sullivan. We're gonna look at some 18th and 19th century clothing that we actually have in the uh, collection here at Middleton Place. So we hope you'll tune in tomorrow and be able to see those. It's, it's kind of a special treat, shall we say. It is. Yeah. Right. Hands on History Thursday tomorrow, right here on Facebook, 11 a.m. So thank you all so much. Nicole, Jeff, thank you. Thanks for your expertise. Bye, we appreciate we'll it. We'll see you thank all you. tomorrow. Uh -huh. Thank you so, so much.